there still are is as we as we've seen with independent watchmakers and the rise of interest in independent watchmakers there's still an opportunity for those sort of innovative watchmakers and are Absolutely. you seeing that happening here in the USA are you seeing american watchmakers becoming more interested in really advancing techniques in watchmaking Hello and welcome back to our collectability podcast with our special guest this week Nicholas Manousis who is the executive director of the Horological Society of New York. My name is Tanya Edwards and in part 1 of this conversation which I hope you watched I asked Nick a very important question which is will there ever be a thriving American watch industry again. And I'd like to start part two of our conversation today with you answering that question, Nick. Sure, sure. Uh, well, uh, I think my, my brief answer was yes and no. Uh, and to, to get some context there, we need to think about where was the American watch industry uh, when it was at its peak? Uh, why was it so big? What was it doing? What was it doing differently than than other countries, other industries? Uh, and the, the big differentiator was the American inter interchangeable parts system, uh, where there was a, a very reliable system of spare parts for watches. Uh, so if you you know you drop your watch and uh, the balance staff breaks, take it to, to the watchmaker. They just order a replacement balance staff and and fit it, and you're good to go. Before that, that concept didn't really exist. Every part was made from scratch. And what this, what this new system allowed uh, the American industry to do was to, to get very big and to, you know, to, to really produce many, many more watches than, than any other industry in the world. Uh, in the watches it was producing, and this is the interesting part that we really need to understand, the the American watches were di very different than watches coming out from other countries. They were utilitarian objects, things that people needed for their everyday life. Uh, now we're in New York, so this doesn't is not really an apples to oranges comparison because we don't all need cars here. But I like to use the car metaphor. Uh, so a lot of most of the rest of the U.S. you need a car to to really. To, mm -hmm. to live. And yes, yeah, some people drive really fancy cars, but most people drive just a regular car, you know, just a car to get you from point A to point B. It's not particularly fancy. It's not a, a Ferrari or Lamborghini. It's just a car and you use it to live your life. A watch was the same type of thing back then. So it, it was um, an object that you needed to, to make it to your appointments on time, to know when to get up and to uh, go back home. Um, and there were very fancy watches, uh, very complicated and expensive watches, uh, but that was not the specialty of the American watch industry. The specialty of the American watch industry was to produce the largest number of precise and reliable watches it possibly could. And that's what it did. So in a way, it was industrializing yes. the watchmaking industry. Yes. And obviously, that was fine at the time when everybody needed a utilitarian watch to yes. tell them the time. Nowadays, we don't need a we watch don't. like that because we we've got our phones, we've got clocks everywhere, we listen, we hear the time yeah. being mentioned. So um, so in that respect, okay, so there won't, there's no need anymore for that mass production of watchmaking. No. But... There still are, is, as, we, as we've seen, with independent watchmakers and the rise of interest in independent watchmakers, there's still an opportunity for those sort of innovative watchmakers. And are Absolutely. you seeing that happening here in the USA? Are you seeing American watchmakers becoming more interested in really advancing techniques in watchmaking? Yes, yes. And so that's the yes part to my answer. So the no part is no, we're not going to have an industrial level production mm -hmm. anymore. Uh, but the yes part is we're going to we're going to have some really exciting independent watchmakers making watches in the US. And that is wonderful news. We, we already are. Uh, there already are some that, that are, are doing doing that. And uh, 
Uh, you know, we've, we've got the first American-made watch since 1969, since when Hamilton stopped making watches here with uh, Josh Shapiro and his team in, in Los Angeles. Uh, he's got an incredible team there. Uh, in, I think that's just the start. There's, there's such an enthusiasm for, uh, for watchmaking today in the U.S., especially with young watchmakers uh, going to school, making their own watches, uh, in, and beginning to to do real manufacturing here in the U.S. And when I, when I say real manufacturing, what does that mean? It means actually cutting parts out of metal and putting them into your watches. It's not just designing a watch mm -hmm. and importing a movement right. from somewhere else and, yes. and putting the, move, uh, the movement in. Yes, real manufacturing is happening. It's it's continuing to, to pick up uh, every day. And I think we have a, a very bright future for independent watchmaking here in the U.S. That is wonderful news. Yeah. And I'm so excited to hear that. And actually, it's a wonderful segue into the Horological Society of New York, mm -hmm. because that started off as a guild for watchmakers, didn't it? To, mm -hmm. to, to, to help watchmakers. So could you tell us a little bit about the history of the Horological Society, which began in 1866? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so back in 1866, if you were a watchmaker working in New York, you were most likely German. Uh, that's just the way it was. And a, uh, a small group of, of watchmakers that were working in lower Manhattan decided to get together and form an organization to help each other out. And why, why do this? It was because they were all working independently. And so they needed some way to help each other out, to look out for each other. Uh, you know, they they established a fund to uh, to pay uh, sick benefits and death benefits uh, to a spouse. You know, if if uh, if a watchmaker died, and it was it was a guild, which is kind of like an old fashioned way of saying a union today. Yes. It was a union for independent watchmakers working in New York, um, and the organization uh, it it uh, quickly grew. It established a library, it held monthly lectures, it had an annual gala, uh, it gave awards. And this all sounds familiar because this is all stuff that we still continue to do today. Um, in the, the history of HSNY very closely follows the history of the American watchmaking industry, uh, where they both reached their peak kind of around the same time, and then they both declined. Uh, and in the uh, the eighties and nineties, in early two thousands, the American watchmaking industry was virtually gone, uh, and the Horological Society of New York also was virtually gone. There, were, it was just down to a handful of of members that that were left. Uh, and then today, things have changed. Things have changed a lot today, and um, thanks to you, Nick, and, and the effort of your team to really do that. But let, let's just go back a little bit, because I'm fascinated by the fact that it was German watchmakers that were first in, um, in New York, and not English or French or even Swiss. Um, it, it, but you just said that was just how it was. There wasn't a specific reason for that. They, they were the more organised out of the watchmakers to create a guild, would you say? Was that fair? Or Yeah, I, I don't really know the specific reason. I can I can maybe take some educated guesses on it. Uh, there was a large population of German immigrants uh, in New York. Right, that's just, right. That's yeah, so. just a historical fact. Um, it, it was, it was kind of like if you were a, um, if you were a, a chef in mm -hmm. New York mm -hmm. back then, you were most likely French. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you've watched uh, The Gilded Age, you've seen the, you know, the drama around the French chef who maybe is not French. Uh, <laughs> but he and, did a very good yes. French accent. Yes. yes. So yeah, that, that was just kind of, that was just the way it was back Well, then. The Gilded Age, I'm so glad you brought that up because obviously uh, for viewers who, who watched The Gilded Age, and I'm a big fan myself, um, there was a wonderful um, storyline in it where one of the characters, um, a servant, um, was repairing a carriage clock and he just through doing it himself and taking the movement apart and putting it back together again, he realized that he could improve the movement and make it more efficient yep. and work better. Yep. He was put into contact with the German name, which I'm yes. going to have you pronounce. Yeah, the Ur Urmacher Verein New Yorker. <laughs> Thank yeah. you very much yeah. for pronouncing that. Um, and they helped him not only patent the uh, innovative um a new component that he'd come up with, but helped him make that and become a watchmaker. So we saw just from that 
scene that could easily have that little storyline that could easily have been missed if you weren't paying attention but it was but it was important to show that a this was a time when everything was changing in in America wasn't mm-hmm. it it was the railroads the, the real wealth started to come into the country yeah. and with it came the need for watches and clocks mm. that's a fascinating start to it all and um i'm so glad that it's now become part of our culture that it was recognized in yeah. a in a in a yeah. in a story um and the name didn't change did it until i think it was 1932 is that right when after world war ii there were so many more immigrants yes. in a new york yes. that we needed an english language that's yes. what everybody was speaking an yeah. english title the the organization went through a, a series of different german names uh, and then uh, English names until it finally settled on the Horological Society of New York. Uh, I believe it was 1930 when when that was uh, was was officially changed. Um, yeah, but uh, the important thing is that the organization never stopped. Never stopped. And I think it's it's very interesting when we think about. Um, watchmaking and horology as a whole, that this is one of the world's longest running horological associations, which is a real achievement. I mean, it's only going to be beaten by one probably in England that's been going many hundreds of years ago. There's two two in England. Uh, The the oldest is the Worshipful Company of Clockmakers and the uh, second place is the uh, British Horological Institute. Right, and the the Worshipful Company of Clockmakers, of course, was a similar thing, a guild Mm -hmm. that looked after its the people that worked in the industry. Yeah. So um, I love that connection to history very much indeed. Now, fast forward, as we, as you mentioned earlier, to the early 2000s, and in line with the changes in not only the American watch industry, but the watch industry as a whole, things had changed quite a lot. Mm-hmm. In, the, in the 70s and 80s, we saw the arrival of quartz technology, and watches were being able to be made much, much more, less expensive and in more larger numbers again, but in a different sort of way. Everything in the watch industry started to change. And the HSNY, um, you that's when when you really start came along as part of your immersion into the New York community. When you'd finished watchmaking school in Miami and you came up here. What tell us about one of those early meetings that you went to? Uh, well, the the early meetings uh, that I went to, uh, it was I think my first meeting was oct- October two thousand thirteen. Uh huh. And it was a very small group, maybe ten or fifteen people, and I was definitely the youngest person there uh, by a long shot. <laughs> uh, so it was it was clear what was going on that the uh, uh, the industry had changed. Mechanical watches were back in fashion. People were buying them. They're very popular. Uh, the Horological Society of New York had continued to operate the entire time, but it, but people didn't know it was there anymore. Yes, yes. Uh, it, it didn't have a website, did not have any type of online presence, was not advertising itself to uh, to new people to come and join. Uh, so when when I joined, that was that was my my big goal was just to get it online, let just to let people know that. It existed, that, that, that it was there. So, because to begin with, you didn't have an office, did you? Is it no. true that you met in the basement of a memorial chapel? Is that right? Uh, yes, well, it was the first floor, thankfully, <laughs> because, because the basement was the uh, the place that you don't want to be in, in the in the funeral home. <laughs> uh, uh, but, it, yes, yeah, so one, one of our, our members, uh, one of our longtime members uh, was the, uh, he still is the director of, of the Riverside Memorial Chapel on the Upper West Side. Right. Yeah, he very graciously, I mean, he, he said, Saved HSNY. He, he gave us a home uh, for uh, for about a decade um, when we did not have anywhere else to go. And if it wasn't for that, uh, the organization wouldn't be around anymore. So our uh, so back then our, our our meetings, our lectures were at the funeral home in in the chapel in the funeral home, and we quick, quickly outgrew it. And we realized we needed to uh, to move. Okay. Well, in we're round about. 2015, you did move to the very beautiful building that you're in now, mm-hmm. um, which is the General Society building in Midtown Manhattan. Yes, yes. And um, I really encourage anyone, well, first of all, you're going to hear it a bit, quite a bit in this podcast is please join HSNY. Full disclosure, I myself am a trustee and very proud to be to be that and to be on the board. And um, 
we'll talk a lot more about why it's important to join, but you can go and visit. And it's like, a, to me, I think your offices, especially the library, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail, is one of the most beautiful places you can just go and mm-hmm. get away from the from yep. the, 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 the busyness of the city and, and really be calm and relaxed. Let's talk about membership. So obviously it had wheedled down to virtually hardly anything when you joined. Where are you now? What, what's membership now? And and tell us about the monthly meetings, which still happen, mm-hmm. but they have the slightly different attendance rate now, I think. Is that yes. right? Yes. Oh, well, we, have, we have thousands of members uh, all around the world. That's important. They're not just in New York. Uh, they're so all, that's a all big change world. that's happened. Yes. Yes. Very big change. Uh, very, very thankful for that change because the, the, the members that we have now, they're really the foundation of the organization. Uh, members pay a, a small annual fee to, to become a member. And when you, when you do, you get one of these nice lapel pins. Uh, it's just a, a, a small fee, but uh, it allows us to do what we do today. It, it allows us to operate a, a, li- a research library that's open to the public, uh, uh, it al- allows us to uh, to hold our monthly lecture series that is also free and open to the public um, and award our, our scholarships. You're right. You started a very reasonable price point, which I'm, I'm going to share here is a hundred pound, a hundred pounds, hundred dollars, hundred dollars a month. And um, with that, you get this pin, which we, I really notice a lot of people very proudly wear, mm-hmm. actually. And then there's two other levels after that. Could you tell us what they are? Uh, the silver and gold uh, membership levels, and we, we kind of we tried to model it after the like the Met Museum or the MoMA Museum, where they have these different levels of membership, and you get different amounts of uh, benefits and swag. You get swag. You get really yes. good swag. Yes, you do. and I have some swag here, which I'm going to show you. Um, at the silver level, you'll also get this very smart bag, and at the gold level, you will get this extremely smart. 44th Street jacket, and it's called that because that's the location, 44th Street, mm-hmm. off the HSNY here in New York. Mm-hmm. And um, this is designed by the Armoury and Mark Cho, who owns the Armoury. We, we've had him actually on this podcast before. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, he's a great fan of HSNY, which is why he did this very generous offer of providing yeah, incredible. people at that that gold level, which is $1,000 membership level. So I think that's really good value because you do get a really lovely jacket yep. and it's made to fit you. So um, that's that. it's good value for sure. Speaking for sure. Of, uh, of Mark Cho in Hong Kong, we are doing classes in Hong Kong this weekend. Oh, you are? How wonderful. Okay, so that so that that brings us on to exactly what I wanted to talk about. The mission of HSNY is really to educate people mm-hmm. about watchmaking. Yep. And um, the best way you can do that is to teach people watchmaking. Mm-hmm. And so that's a relatively new thing. Is that right? Around about 2016, you started to do to do watchmaking classes internationally or for those internationally? Yes. Yes. The international classes. We've been teaching classes in New York since 1950. So a, a, oh, long, in 19, time. a long time. And yes. am I right that in the 1950s, you actually taught um, children in high school yes. watchmaking. Yes, yeah, yeah. So the HSNY developed the curriculum for New York City public uh, high schools, and back then watchmaking was an elective at public high schools because it was a very common job, just like being a, a, a mechanic mm-hmm. or a welder or a plumber or an electrician. Uh, maybe you take an elective class on those trades, and watchmaking was a very viable trade. Uh, back then. So what we're trying to do now is to kind of get back there and convince people that watchmaking is is very viable. It's a very stable career. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and that's that's what we really try to do, do with our scholarships and with all of our our initiatives. Well, well, let's let's let, we'll get to the scholarships because I think that they're really important. But but let's talk about these watchmaking classes because I have taken part in a couple myself and I can't emphasize how much fun it is to actually go into the workshop that's in the HSNY office here in New York and sit down at a workbench, take apart a pocket watch and put it back together again. And there's four different levels, is Mm -hmm. that right? Yep. And um, you can either do those yourself, start at at the first level, 101, and work your way up to 104. Or you also offer private classes 
Um, so a group can come together, which is great for team building and corporations, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Or it's a wonderful gift to somebody who's fanatical about watches mm -hmm. because nothing makes you really understand and appreciate watchmaking more than learning how the mechanism the movement works and you can only understand that by doing it yourself yeah. and appreciate yeah. how hard it is yeah. it's really difficult and um i know from my own experience it's totally changed my respect for watchmakers and the amount of time you have to learn how to do something so so that's a that's a, a wonderful um um gift that gives back from 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 the association and now that you're doing it internationally or, and also around the US is that right yeah all around the US it's our traveling education program we we noticed uh, a lot of people were flying to New York to take the classes so we thought let's fly to them and let's go to major cities and, and teach the classes there and that's what we're doing with, with the traveling education program um, and it's it's been very successful you know otherwise we wouldn't fly all the way around the world to Hong Kong to teach a class for a weekend, but uh, it's, it's, it's very much worthwhile. So that's, that's part of, of what the membership pays for. Yes. And also you have corporate sponsors. Yes. And yeah. I'm very proud to say that Collectability is a corporate sponsor, mm. and we're very, very proud of that fact. Um, but I'm assuming that you're also, obviously, there are watchmakers, watch brands who are, who, who are sponsors. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that that's a goal to, to keep increasing the number of sponsors. Yes. Uh, well, we're, we're getting to a point where we don't have much more room to add sponsor There's logos. too many on, on one. Uh, I think we have 32 or 33 corporate sponsors That's amazing. Now. That's wonderful. You know, many of the major watch brands uh, around the world, and we're very, very thankful uh, to them um, for supporting what, what we're doing. Yes, uh, absolutely. And really believing in uh, in a a neutral nonprofit that's focusing on ed education around horology. Uh, that's, that's that's what we do every day. Wonderful. And another way you raise money, of course, is your annual gala, gala. and yep. auction. Yep. And as you, you mentioned earlier that that was something that HSNY did from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, but then obviously things slowed down a bit, so there wasn't really the number of people to get behind doing yes. an annual ga gala. Yes. But... Um, was it around 2017 that you reinstated the annual gala? And I don't know if this is a rumor, if it's true, but because you found a safety box with vintage watches in it that um, would would, would form of. the base of a wonderful auction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, kind of. We, we reinstated the gala in 2016 for our 150th anniversary. Uh, and then for the 2017 gala, we did uh, find a safety box, safety deposit box that had some watches that were uh, that were uh, given to HSNY donated uh, years ago, I, I, you know, decades and decades ago. And I think there was a Patek Philippe. There was? There. Yeah. How fabulous. Yeah. Uh, there was a, a coin watch, one of those watches. Oh, that's kind of hidden yes. Coin. Those are so special coin uh, watches. Yeah, there was a few very cool watches in there, and we auctioned them in 2017. And then that started the tradition of doing this annual charity auction that we do along with the gala. And it all raises money. It raises a lot of money for a very specific cause to, to give it out to to watchmaking students in the form of scholarships. Well, let's talk about that because I'm very proud to be um, on the on the um, team that um, really looks after the scholarships yep. and appoints appoint, appoints them. And how much money are you giving away now um, in scholarships? So last year we we gave out one hundred twenty five thousand dollars in financial aid to twenty students in four schools, uh, and this year we'll we'll uh, increase it even further. Um, yeah, that's the, the goal is every year to increase it as much as we possibly can until we get to the point where we're giving scholarships to every watchmaking student in the country. Uh, and that seems like a, a huge goal, um, a crazy goal, but it's really not. Uh, there's give or take 40 or 50 students that graduate every year in the entire country. And right now we're awarding almost half of them. So we're, we want to continue growing that. It's so fantastic because as you mentioned earlier, Watchmaking school itself is often free, mm -hmm. um, but what isn't free is accommodation. Yep. And people often have to move their entire families to a new location, don't mm -hmm. they? I mean, you moved yes. across the country yep. to attend watchmaking school. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, your wife was supportive of that. Yep. But but um, it's tough for people to, to attend watchmaking school because there aren't that many of them. So I really can't emphasize enough how wonderful it is that that's what HSNY, one of the main places that money goes to is sponsoring 
mm. people going to watchmaking school and watchmaking schools themselves. Yeah, yeah. And you have quite a few sponsorship um, as well, different sponsorship uh, I've had pots yes. that, that people have started. Mm. And it's very diverse, which mm. I think people should, should appreciate. Mm -hmm. And a couple of new ones, um, for example, that have, that have recently come out are the Benjamin Banneker Scholarship for Black Watchmakers, mm -hmm. um, the Oscar Walden Scholarship for Jewish Watchmakers, mm -hmm. and most recently the Grace Fryer Scholarship for Female Watchmakers. Mm -hmm. And you know, these are names that might not be so recognized to people, but um, they were, each of them were important in the, in the watchmaking industry in America. Yep. Um, Grace Fryer is probably better known as one of the radium girls. Mm -hmm. um, and they were the, the ladies who would put the radium markers on, on, on a dial. And to do so, they would lick this paintbrush and dip it in the radium and paint it on. Yep. And, suffered terribly from yeah, that yeah, it was horrible. poisoning yeah. so um thankfully we don't do that anymore um but it's wonderful that we can remember all the people who who, who made important contributions to american watchmaking through these scholarships yeah that's exactly what we're trying to do yeah well that that's um that's 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 wonderful and and at collectability we we really encourage people to become a watchmaker um it can be a great career and um, as the increase in interest in vintage watches comes about, there's more need now for restoration, repair, mm -hmm. as well as servicing, because obviously now there are many, many more people buying um, mechanical timepieces that, that, just like a car, need to be serviced. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, which I think is one of the most exciting aspects, is that there's this growth now of independent watchmakers, people who want to start their own yep. watch company. Yep. And that's very, very exciting. It's important to be part of that. If you have an interest in watches, it's important to be part of helping to secure the industry. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, uh, you hit the nail on the head. And uh, I think at, at the end of the day, HSNY, the Horological Society of New York, is, it's been around for 158 years now. And uh, we are just taking care of it while we're here. You know, generations of people uh, before before us have have uh, run the organization, have been on the board, have been members, and, and helped to get to this point. And so we need to make sure that it continues on. Uh, you know, 158 years into the future, and that's that's really really what we're we're trying to do these days. Put it on on good footing for the future. Well, you're certainly doing that, Nick. There's no question about that. And um, one resource that you have is the library. Mm -hmm. The, the Jost Berge Research Library, which, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the most beautiful rooms that you can actually go and escape the city mm -hmm. um, and, and, and enjoy because it's open to any member mm -hmm. of yep. HSNY. It's open to the public. Anyone is and welcome. Yeah, Anyone can come in. Yeah. So it's a real sanctuary, I think, is the word that I was looking for. H tell us a little bit about it because it's a very important horological resource. How many books do you have? Uh, it's about twenty five thousand items. That's an enormous number. It's it's huge. It's uh you know it's a it's a functioning research library open to the public and open to researchers. Uh, HSNY has always had a library since the very beginning. Uh, we've got some of our original books, um, but it was a, a small and modest library. In two thousand nineteen. Uh, a, a member of HSNY, a, a very good friend, Fortunat Muther Markey, he uh, approached us and asked if we would be interested in, uh, in in him donating his personal library to us. And his and we went ahead with that, and that's where ninety nine percent of these books comes from. Uh, it's one of the largest horological libraries in the world. Uh, it's uh, you know we've got a a full-time librarian that manages it. We've just, a library intern just started and uh, uh, everyone is welcome. Uh, you don't even need to be to be going there to read a book. We have exhibitions that are uh, open to the public uh, all the time. Uh, and it's, it, like you said, it's, an, it's a nice, comfortable place to, to hang out. Uh, it's, it's hard to get work done because I'm just always reading books <laughs> and discovering new things there. And it's, it's a pretty cool place to, oh. uh, to, to go to work. Oh, what a, it's a lovely place to go to work. And so, as you, you mentioned, you have a librarian, mm -hmm. um, Miranda Maracini, and anyone that has an interest in a particular topic relating to horology, if you want to learn more about 
a tourbillon, for example, mm-hmm. or um, balance, balance, balance wheels and balance springs, or just a brand or any aspect of watchmaking, um, you can contact Miranda and she'll help source the information Mm -hmm. that the library has. And as you can gather, 25,000 pieces of information is enormous. And I'll put it into perspective. The Patek Philippe Library in the museum in Geneva has 5,000 books. And that's regarded as a a large number of books, but this is this is really hence the largest library, horological library in the world. So one of one of them. Okay, but we're very lucky to have it here. Let's put it that way. It's not in some far off European place. It's right here. It's right here in the middle of Manhattan. In the middle of Manhattan, exactly, exactly. The last thing I just really want to talk about um, is is how HSNY, HSNY practically participates in the advancement of art and science. And that's through the HSNY certified chronometer rating mm-hmm. service yeah. that you offer. Yes. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Yep. Uh, so uh, what's a chronometer, first of all? Uh, a chronometer is just a particularly precise watch. And oftentimes chronometers are certified by third parties. Uh, because then it makes it a little bit more trust, trustworthy. If you're going to buy a chronometer from a, from a brand or a watchmaker, and they say, "Hey, this is a chronometer," you know, it's really expensive. You you should buy it. You, you maybe you're more likely to buy it if it's certified by a third party. Uh, just like uh, this happens in many other different industries, and uh, to this day, there's uh, you know, there, there there have not been any uh, American chronometer certifications. Uh, at least not in modern times. So, so we thought this was a this was a good opportunity to start a new initiative, to start certifying watches as uh, chronometers uh, here uh, here in New York, and we certify them to our own standards. Uh, there there is a an ISO standard, ISO the International Standards Organization. They have an ISO, I think it's ISO three one five nine for what a chronometer is, and we go a little bit beyond that, and we say this is an HSNY certified chronometer. And they're tested here here in New York, and we issue a certificate uh, with with the watch when it's tested, uh, just like the old days, and just like uh, what happens in Switzerland uh, and Germany and uh, today. And it's it's fun. It's you know something something a bit different than uh, than what we've we've normally done. But I, I really enjoy testing those watches. It's, it's me who who does it. Oh, it is. That's wonderful. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, um, it's a very important service that you offer through that mm-hmm. chronometer rating, and as we're beginning to see the American watch industry, particularly for independent watchmakers, slowly a little seed that's starting to grow. And maybe more and more American watches will seek out that HSNY chronometer rating as, as indicative of really excellent American watchmaking. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's open to, uh, to anyone, any, any watch brands. It doesn't have, to, doesn't have to be in the US, it could be worldwide, but yeah, we're, uh, the, we're here testing in New York, so it makes sense that American brands would, would, uh, would join us. So you are, obviously the focus of HSNY is America, but you are becoming much more international, as mm-hmm. you mentioned earlier on, that um, you've got a lot more international members. And, and just to, referring back to the gala, um, I've seen that exponentially increase yes. in the number of people that attend it. The last couple of um, galas, there were people from all over the world that were attending yeah. it, which it, is amazing, isn't it? it? It's a really fun night. It's a it's an incredible uh, party. It's more than a party. It's a gala, and people travel from around the world to be there. Uh, we're kind of putting the final touches on this year's gala right now. It's going to be at the Harvard Club. It looks, again, that it'll sell out pretty quickly. Uh, most of the tables are already reserved. Yeah, we've got people you know, traveling from around the world to be there. It's, it's a special night because it's the one night where all of these watch brands can come together in the same room. Uh, these are fierce competitors, day-to-day business. But when they're at the gala, they're not competing. They're there to support education for horology. And that's what makes it so special. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. It's uh, coming up soon, April 6th. Well, I wish you all the very best for that. And encourage anyone who hasn't got a ticket yet for the HSNY Gala, please do so quickly. Mm. Um, So you mentioned that you just want to perpetuate HSNY for the next 158 years. Any other ambitions? I mean, is it just keep it going, keep it growing? Maybe continue to become more international? What, what, what are your goals? 
Oh, the goals always have to match with the mission to advance mm-hmm. the art and science of horology. I think in the in the future we could uh, we could look at the, the the library continuing to expand. Maybe some digitization of of resources in the library. Uh, maybe our our uh, our our watchmaking classes for enthusiasts transform into full time uh, full time watchmaking school. Uh, there's lots of of opportunities, and to me, it's really it's different and refreshing in a way. Uh, running a nonprofit. Uh, because there is no, there is no venture capital investors. Uh, y- y- there's no shareholders. Uh, no one owns it. Uh, we have to be profitable to survive, and we've been profitable every year uh, in recent recent history. And it's it's because of the incredible team that we have. Uh, and the incredible community of members that support the organization. And I, I appreciate you mentioning uh, that, uh, you know, Nick got involved and then it changed. Uh, but it's, it's not just me. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm here while, while I'm alive. I'm living in New York. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to take care of the organization. And uh, there's an incredible team of, of people that, that work, uh, work with me to, to make that possible. Uh, specifically, uh, you know, you mentioned Miranda Maricini, our librarian, Carolina Navarro, our deputy director, uh, Vincent Robert, who uh, just uh, this morning landed in Hong Kong, and I think he's very jet lagged right now, and he's I'm trying, sure. trying to uh, get ready for this classes this weekend. And all of our instructors that uh, they work as full time watchmakers in New York during the day, and then they come and teach classes in the evenings and weekends. Just a, an absolutely incredible team. That's that's. Uh, all they all come together for a, a, a common goal, and that's to to promote horology to, to the public because it's it's something that uh, that we all love. Well, you, you, that's for sure, Nick. And I want to thank you and your brilliant team for doing what you do, and please continue to do it. Thank you, thank you, Tony, for as long as you possibly can. Thank you. And um, I really, as you gathered, encourage listeners: please join the Horological Society of New York. Your money is really well invested and you're helping to perpetuate the watchmaking industry and the art of watchmaking. We we need new watchmakers, we we need support and uh, this is a wonderful way to do it. So thank you very much, Nick. Thank you very much, Tanya. Really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Oh, thank you. Well, I really, really appreciate you taking the time and it was so, so much fun to learn more about HSNY. And I want to thank you, our listeners, for joining us today and I hope that you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please like and subscribe so you don't miss any future podcasts. This is Tanya Edwards for Collectability.